Good morning, everyone. I am Jim Spears, Executive Director with Art South Dakota, and it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I'm looking forward to this session. Um, first, I want to say a quick thank you to our, our supporters and sponsors, um, the South Dakota Arts Council, the Bush Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, these webinars have become a, a, a mainstay of our professional development programming. We started them during COVID um, uh, for the obvious reasons, and uh, they've been very popular. So we're looking forward to continuing them uh, into the future. And I wanna thank you all for being here with us. Uh, as artists um, across the state, you uh, are business owners, you are entrepreneurs, and, uh, and, and we uh, appreciate the work you do and we hope this session is informative. Um, on behalf of the team here at Art South Dakota, any, any ideas you have for webinars, send them our way, send them to any of us. We'd love to, uh, uh, to uh, learn your, your thoughts on that, your ideas, and we'll try to incorporate those into the future. Uh, this tax session, uh, is one that has been mentioned uh, several times over several years. So we're happy to be able to do that today. Um, I also wanna mention just a couple other programs coming up. Uh, one, um, I, I won't go into details. In fact, uh, Andrew may have more information on this, but uh, one is the Artist, or the Arts Leadership Institute uh, taking place here in a couple weeks. Uh, it's a new program for us. It's a two day deep dive into a specific topic um, for uh, arts leaders and administrators this year. It's about fundraising and telling your story. Um, and then we are reopening, or actually for the first time, opening our Artist Emergency Relief Fund. We started that during COVID as a, as a pandemic relief, but now we're going to continue that fund, hopefully into perpetuity, um, for those uh, you know, those uh, times when, when we all face hardship and, and we wanted to be able to offer some assistance with an artist emergency relief fund. You can find more information about that on our website, um, artsouthdakota.org, or I think Andrew's probably putting the information in the comments. So uh, I, I just wanna tell you quickly that this session is, is an important one. Um, I remember as a musician, when I first started booking uh, bands in, in South Dakota, not long after I graduated college, I had to learn all of this stuff. Um, as a musician, and this is still the case, you know, we are our business owners and therefore we uh, collect uh, and remit sales tax. And um, so this is one of those things that I, I sort of dug through the, the website and, and, and colleagues and trying to learn it on the fly. And it's so good to have the Department of Revenue, Lori and Jean with us today to share this information. I know we'll learn a lot. And uh, just a reminder, today is really about... Um, the current requirements in, in mechanics, the, the, the uh, policy as it is in place today. I know there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, potentially uh, changing that tax policy in the future. That's something to talk about, just not what this webinar is about. This is really about navigating the current system uh, for state sales tax. So I uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you to the team at Art South Dakota. I know we have uh, Sherry Cosell out in the lead online today with us, as well as Sarah Larson. And then across the table from me is my colleague uh, and our Director of Community Development, Andrew Reinhardt. So I'm going to pass it to him now. Well, thanks, Jim, and just wanted to echo um, thank you again so much to, to both Lori and Jean for being able to join us today from, from the Department of Revenue. Um, a couple of other things to note, we do have another session coming up, another webinar. We're collaborating with the water can, the watering can out of Sioux Falls. They've been doing a really wonderful in-person uh, and streaming on Facebook live uh, series of sessions for artists, but we'll be collaborating with them on an upcoming session in May with Jim Mathis, who is uh, the lead of an advertising agency see here in Sioux Falls AdWorks uh, and he'll be talking about some social media tips and tricks for artists so if you're looking for a little bit more information about uh, some ways to to use social media to get your art out uh, to your to your uh, clients and to others that would love the work you do uh, please uh, consider registering for that zoom seminar as well um, and then for today, um, we'll be facilitating the Q&A with, with Lori and Jean. Uh, if you could, please use the Q&A button in Zoom. It's easier for us to track the questions that way, and we'll make sure they get to the presenters. Uh, but also feel free to use the chat function to talk to each other, to say hello, or to ask any technical questions if you're having any issues. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lori and Jean. And thank you all again so much for being here with us today.
All right. Have you got my screen? Looks great. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Haupt, and I am a revenue supervisor based out of our Rapid City office um, for the Department of Revenue. I'm being joined today by my esteemed colleague, Jean Richard, who's a senior revenue agent, uh, also based here in Rapid City. She graciously agreed to back me up since I caught a little bit of a cold, and if my voice suddenly gives out, she's going to uh, come to the rescue. So, <laughs> but we're a good team. We'll uh, we'll try to keep it interesting. We know taxes are everyone's so exciting favorite subject. So, a um, little bit about me. I've worked at the Department of Revenue just about 25 years now. So, most days I pretend like I know what I'm doing. Uh, Jean, you've been here, what, 17, I believe, right? Yes, I just turned 19 with the Department of Revenue. 19, yes. <laughs> so, you're getting. Uh, a lot of experience from us. We welcome questions from you. We like to know, you know, what it is you want to know from us so we can best help you. Um, and with that, I'm going to get rolling here. Here's the little disclaimer our legal team likes us to put out there. Um, if you do have a specific question or a situation where you want us to give you a, a you know, a written description of here's how your tax is going to apply, we'll happily do that just to be aware that this information is general in nature. And so it may not always fit everyone's exact specific circumstances. So that is what this scenario here, sorry, my eyes are dripping. <laughs> um, so sales taxes, everyone's favorite topic, I'm sure. Creative types like you, I'm guessing, probably don't really have a lot of always interest in, in uh, handling the minutia of sales tax and book work. But the good news is, is that's why people like Jean and I are here, because we want to help you and we want to help you do it right. Um, most of the time in our profession, we find that people aren't deliberately out to cheat. It's because they just don't know. And what we want to do here is, is help you figure things out. And if we get nothing else out of this session, just to show we're not mean and scary tax people, it's okay to come ask us questions. So... <laughs> Let us help you as we get going here. Um, basics with sales tax, just very basically, most states in the United States will have some form of sales tax. And every state is going to do it a little bit differently. So if you're navigating through a variety of different states, you may want to check with the different states you're in to see um, how that's going to work. Our advice here is all going to apply just to the state of South Dakota, so I can't promise what I'm telling you today is going to be true for North Dakota or Minnesota or any of our surrounding states. Um, when we talk about who needs a sales tax license, in South Dakota, we look at, we tax what we call tangible personal property. That's the things you can hold and you can touch. And we also tax many services in South Dakota. So when you're talking with the art community, we're talking about physical artwork, sculpture, painting, jewelry, craft work, all those things are gonna be sales taxable. Um, we're also talking about digital items. If you have downloads of books or music, um, downloadable patterns, and also services such as bands, um, dancers, DJs, karaoke, all of these things are taxable services in the state of South Dakota. And I think, Jean, I'm going to let you take this one. All right. So in South Dakota, we have a number of different types of tax licenses. Um, specifically for this industry, the arts industry, you're going to be issued a sales tax license um, because you are selling a product or providing a service that is subject to sales tax. In addition, you'll see we've got some other um, types of licenses. You've got the contractor's excise tax license. You've got manufacturer's license. You've got a use tax license and a wholesale license. And we issued those licenses specific to the type of industry. So um, if you've got somebody coming out to fix your plumbing, well, they're going to have a contractor's excise tax license to be able to provide that service. If you're located in a community that manufactures a product, well, because they typically don't sell to the end user or the consumer, we're gonna issue them a manufacturer's license. Uh, typically uh, medical professions because the medical industry, the services provided by licensed healthcare uh, practitioners, um, they don't owe sales tax because that's specifically exempt from sales tax. When you go get your teeth cleaned, 
um, you're not paying sales tax on that service. So we issue a use tax license to these types of organizations because while their services that they're providing are not subject to sales tax, they may have some purchases that are subject to use tax. And so um, also with wholesalers, we have a lot of um, companies out there that never sell to the end consumer. Um, they only sell to retailers. So they would get a wholesale license. And, and basically that's helpful for us when we look at a license number to give us a general idea, of what kind of business are we working with here? Is it a sales taxable business? Is it a construction type business? Are we talking to a manufacturer? Are we talking to a wholesaler? Or are we talking to somebody who typically just reports use tax to us and just having those license types, it just helps the department as a whole in general. But for your situation, for what you are doing, you're gonna be issued a sales tax license. Sales tax and nexus. So which customers should you charge sales tax? Well, nexus is the word that's used to say, when somebody has a significant presence or a, a physical presence in our state, meaning that they do either enough business economically, or maybe they send in somebody from their home state to come in and um, uh, like a salesperson to go around and make sales. So they, they create that presence in our state. And so when a company has nexus, they are required to be licensed with the state of South Dakota, and they are required to collect the appropriate amount of sales tax. When you're an artist who primarily works from your home or studio, then you will have that physical presence in your home state. So you've got that nexus, that significant presence in your home state. Okay. When you come into South Dakota and maybe you attend one or two shows, that's really not significant enough for us to require that you have a tax license. So we may allow you to come in and set up and report your sales tax, you still have to pay the sales tax under a special event form. And we'll talk more about those a little bit later. Um, but for those of you who are in South Dakota, it doesn't matter the amount of sales that you have. It matters that you have that presence in our state. And because the product or service that you're selling is subject to sales tax, that's what requires you to have a sales tax license with us. You're here and you're doing something that's subject to tax. Um, we have a list on this slide about common um, business activities that create sales tax nexus. So having that location, having an employee, salesperson, um, a drop shipping relationship. So that means you, you do enough um, from an out-of-state company, enough business into our state with a third-party drop shipping company, um, an affiliate. Um, so some states consider third-party affiliates who send customers into your online store to create nexus and attending those art shows and craft fairs. So how to apply for a sales user contractor's excise tax license? Um, we do that online. So you'll just go to our uh, website, the sd.gov slash tax app. You can go to our main page also. Um, which I believe at the end of this seminar, we'll have the dor.sd.gov. Um, but when you go in and you do the application, um, you don't have to set up an account. Um, if you've got all the information you need sitting there in front of you, and by information, I mean, what's your business entity name? Are you a sole proprietor? Are you an LLC? Are you a corporation? Do you have um, an EIN with the IRS? You need to, you know, to have that if you create a business entity. Um, and then your addresses, your phone number. So when you've got that basic information about your business, there's no need to create an account when you do your license application. Um, if you are a bookkeeper who may be doing applications for multiple clients, that's when it's appropriate to do or set up an account to do that application. Um, when you're in the application and you see some revenue terms that you may not be familiar with, you can always pick up the phone and call our 800 number. Um, there's agents from across the state who work that 800 number line that are like myself and Lori who have extensive sales tax 
um, expertise and also we know the type of information that's needed in this application because we are the ones who process those applications and issue those tax licenses. And then you can also come in and visit one of our tax offices. Um, we've got locations all across the state. Um, and I believe we have that at the end as well where we're located at. And we can answer those questions um, in Rapid City, the support staff that we have answering the phone. I think those ladies have so much knowledge when it comes to this. They can probably answer your question better about the screens on that application than I can. <laughs> so please reach out to us if you're in the application and you've got questions. And you know, if you think of something after the application has been submitted, just reach out to us. We'll get you to the agent who's been assigned your application and we can add in any missing information. And there's nothing that you do on your end that we can't change on our end. So if you decide uh, I wanna tweak my business name a little bit, or um, I put in my home mailing address, now I have a PO box for my business. Those are the types of things that we can add in. And when we issue that tax license, um, we can make sure that it is set up correctly for you. Right. Okay. okay, so we're gonna move on to um, sales tax. So once you've applied for your sales tax license, and your license um, is in the process of getting issued, you'll be in contact by a revenue agent. And that revenue agent is going to um, ask about your business activity. And then they're going to talk about how sales and use tax applies to your business. And the most important thing is knowing the correct sales tax rate to charge. So it's important for you to understand that that total sales tax rate has a couple different components to it. So the main component being the state sales tax rate, that applies to all products and services in the state of South Dakota. So it doesn't matter what part of the state that you're in, the state sales tax rate will apply. So if the product and the service is subject to sales tax, you're gonna start with that four and a half percent tax rate, okay? And then we're gonna build from that to get our total sales tax rate. Now you can see up here, and you've probably heard on the news that the sales tax rate is going to change from the 4.5% and it's gonna be lower to the 4.2%. So right now, as you are making sales, we still want you using that 4.5% all the way through the end of June and then effective July 1st, that's when you need to change that sales tax rate and lower it to 4.2 and then you'll add your city tax and your tourism tax and I'm going to build on those here in just a moment. Um, we apply sales tax to products also known as tangible personal property to any products that are transferred electronically. So if you are a photographer and you're taking photos and you are sending those photos instead of making the prints you're sending those photos to your customer electronically then that that photo session and those photos that you send electronically are also subject to sales tax as well as services. So if you're in the entertainment industry, maybe you are a singer or you play the guitar and when you provide that entertainment service, those musical services, those are also subject to sales tax. And you will note here that construction services, they get that contractor's excise tax license. That excise tax is different and distinct from the sales tax. So as you get real good and real comfortable with your sales tax, and then you hire uh, somebody in the construction industry to come and replace a faucet or maybe paint your house or whatever, and you notice that they're not charging you sales tax, but they're charging you maybe a 2% rate or 2.041% rate, that's the contractor's excise tax. And so when you see that, don't panic, but if you do have questions on it, you know, ask your contractor. If you don't get a satisfactory answer there, then feel free to give us a call because we'll be happy to talk to you and explain how construction services are taxed differently than sales taxable products and services. Okay, so building on from the state tax, we have the city general sales tax. So if it's subject to the state sales tax is also subject to the city tax. 
if it's not subject to state tax because it's exempt by law, so think those exempt medical services, then it's also exempt from city tax. So state tax laws and city tax go hand in hand, okay? Cities in South Dakota, and I think there's at least 200 of them, have a city tax rate that can be between 1% and 2%. And it's based on where your customer receives the product or where they receive that service, or if you have a product that's used, stored, or consumed within a city, okay? city tax will apply in addition to that state sales tax. Now, <clears throat> additional tax may be due if a product or service is used, stored, or consumed in a different city that imposes a higher rate of tax than what was previously paid. What we mean by that is, if you happen to be located in a city that has a, let's say 1% tax rate. So let's, let's talk about WASTA. Wasta is a very small community between New Underwood and Wall. And so if you're not familiar with New Underwood, that's a small community that's east of Rapid City. And Wall is about an hour east of Rapid City. New Underwood is probably about a half hour or so east of Rapid City off of I-90. And so if you received a product, so let's say you ordered a tent, um, you're a vendor that goes and you set up in festivals in the park, and you sell a product and you've got a tent that you typically have your tables and all your products sold under to help protect you from the sunshine and the weather. And let's say in one of these nasty South Dakota winds, that tent gets destroyed and you have to order a new one. You order it off Amazon, it gets drop shipped to your home in Wasta. Amazon collects five and a half percent sales tax from you. So they're collecting the four and a half percent state tax plus the one percent Wasta municipal sales tax to get that total five and a half percent sales tax rate. And then you take that vendor tent and you use it at a vendor event in Wall. Well, the city of Wall has a 2% city tax rate. So Amazon charged you what was legally due, five and a half percent sales tax. But when you take that tent into Wall, you've only paid five and a half percent sales tax and Wall has a general sales tax rate of 2% plus the four and a half percent tax rate, state tax rate of four and a half percent. So they've got a six and a half percent total general sales tax rate. So now you've got a 1% tax gap between what you paid for it, receiving it in WASTA and where you're using it in WALL, which has a higher rate. So in that case, you do have a 1% difference that you will have to pay on your next sales tax return because you took that product into a city that has a higher tax rate. So when these situations occur, number one, you'll only pay that additional 1% one time, okay? So it doesn't matter where else you go in South Dakota, that 6.5% will cover you because the highest the city can have is a 2% city tax rate, okay? And then, um, getting that reported so wall gets that one percent because that's where you're using it um that's something that could be a little bit tricky so please feel free to reach out to us we can walk you through this over the phone or stop in your local revenue office and we can help you do that math so that one percent tax gets reported correctly okay all right so in addition to the city general sales tax rate, cities have a 1% municipal gross receipts tax. And if you've been in South Dakota long enough, you knew back when I started this job 19 years ago, we used to call it the bed, board and booze tax. And you can see from here, it's a little bit more than lodging, a little bit more than eating establishments, and a little bit more than alcohol sales. Cities can elect to add an additional 1% to ticket sales or um, admissions to places of amusement, athletic, and cultural events, okay? So in our city tax guide, we've got this great, um, it's a, a chart, <laughs> sorry. We have this great chart that shows you all the cities, what their general city sales tax rate is, and what they are assessing, if any, to this municipal gross receipts tax. 
typically you're going to find if you're going into a, a fairly um, average size city that they're they're going to be taxing um, the alcohol, the the restaurants, the lodging, and they may or may not tax these ticket sales. Rapid City they tax the ticket sales. And you come in and you go to a show at the monument. Um, you're going to be paying state, city, city gross receipts, and we'll talk about tourism as well. And just a moment, but you're going to be paying all of these tax rates, but not all cities do that. So the most important thing to do is to um, check that city tax guide because that chart in there is just wonderful. It will tell you exactly what that city general rate is and what, if any, additional gross receipts tax is assessed there. Okay. Yep, and we can get you that link for that. So in addition to your state 4.5%, in addition to your, your general city tax, and in addition to the municipal gross receipts tax, you can have tourism tax added as part of your total sales tax rate. So tourism tax will apply if you are selling or providing a service at certain types of industries. So hotels, campgrounds, um, you know, if they're located in Rapid City, and I apologize for always using Rapid City, but this is where I'm most familiar. Um, they have the state tax of four and a half percent. They have the Rapid City general rate of 2%. Rapid City elects to do all of the municipal gross receipts tax. So they do the, the 1% on lodging and they do the one and a half percent tourism tax because tourism tax applies to hotels and places of lodging. So you're paying a 9% sales tax total if you come and stay in a hotel in Rapid City. And then you may see on your bill, some cities do have an additional um, occupational tax. It's like a $2 per night per room that Rapid City hotels that have 50 or more rooms pay and they pay that directly to the city. So that's not something that the state monitors or collects here in Rapid City. That's collected at the city level. What you're more concerned about when you look at your receipts is, you know, what is the sales tax rate? And because you're at a hotel, that should be 9% here in Rapid City. So it applies to hotels, campgrounds, uh, applies to motor vehicle rentals, um, recreational services, and where it applies in your industry is if you set up at a spectator event. So we have this great publication on tourism tax um, and it goes in and it gives you examples of what a recreational service is, recreational equipment, spectator events, visitor attractions, visitor intensive businesses. Um, but for this seminar, your spectator events, those are gonna be the, um, festivals that you go to. It's going to be the, um, well, in Rapid City, we have uh, summer nights on 7th where vendors will set up and they will sell. There's usually entertainment bands, there's food trucks. It's a big family event that happens in downtown Rapid City. And I know that some other of the communities around here have something similar as well. I think that what has something up in Law Square. I know every year um, the community of Spearfish hosts a huge um, festival in the park. And that would be considered a um, part of that spectator event because it's an exhibition or exposition that is open to the public. And so when you set up and you sell at an event that's subject to the tourism tax, so let's say you sell a product. So it doesn't matter if it's artwork, pottery, um, crafts that you do. If you're setting up uh, in Spearfish at that festival in the park, you're going to do the 4.5% state sales tax the 2% Spearfish general municipal tax and the 1.5% tourism tax. So you're gonna have a total of 8% sales tax that you will um, collect and remit at spectator events. Um, visitor attractions are also subject to tourism tax. So those are like your historic sites, your museums, music shows, zoological gardens, hunting preserves are included in visitor attractions. And again, a more comprehensive list is in that tourism tax facts. And then visitor intensive businesses. Um, we define a visitor intensive business as a certain type of business that receives 50% or more of their total revenues for the year during the months of June, July, August, and September. 
So think, if you're in Western South Dakota, think about um, the, the um, candy stores that open up, the jewelry stores, leather goods shops, rock shops, souvenir shops, and they were only open during the months of June, July, August, and September. Some of them open in May, of course, but the tourism tax would apply if your business meets the category of a visitor intensive business, that tourism tax would only apply during the months of June, July, August, and September. So I know the application of tourism tax can get a little confusing. So when you've got questions about that, please feel free to give us a call, shoot us an email, reach out to us, um, especially um, you know, to the local office in your area. I know a lot about Western South Dakota, but I don't know everything that happens in Spearfish because you know my sites and my focus is Rapid City. Um, if you're down in that Yankton area, I think there's uh, riverboat days that go on. You know, you've got an office right there in Yankton and you can call and talk about those events that are happening in your area to get more specific um, tax rate because I don't know if, you know, if that happens within the city limits of Yankton, right? Um, but an agent from the Yankton Revenue Office is going to know exactly where that event is taking place at and will be able to get you that question answered right away. Okay. All right. I think it's back to you, Lori. Yep, back to me. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about specifically how the sales tax applies to your sales. Um, and we're going to start with the most common option is when you're making an in-person sale, say you're selling your product out of a studio. Here again, I used my example of Rapid City because that's where I am. Um, the sales tax in South Dakota is going to be due where your customer receives that product. So I've got a couple of examples on here. If a customer walks into your studio in Rapid City, at this time, the sales tax rate on that would be 6.5%, which is the 4.5% state tax, and the 2% Rapid City municipal tax. Now, I should do the proviso of, there again, be aware the sales tax rate is changing July 1st, going down to 42 Um but at this point, I have all my examples of what it is currently today. Um, now, a similar example, your customer calls you on the phone and orders it and says, can you ship it to me in Sioux Falls, South Dakota? So in this case, you're still going to have same sales tax rate at 6.5%. It's the same state rate, 4.5%, going down to 42 in July. But the city tax is going to go to South to Sioux Falls, because that is where the customer is going to receive that product because you shipped it to them there in Sioux Falls. Now, I know somebody had a question in the chat here earlier. Well, what if I shipped it to another state entirely? So let's say someone came into your studio and they're here on vacation. I don't want to carry this around in my suitcase. Can you ship it to my home in another state? So in this example, I shipped it to my customer in Minneapolis, Minnesota there will be no South Dakota sales tax on that at all because that customer received it outside of the state of South Dakota. Now, you'll want to check with Minnesota whether they're going to have any tax liability, but as far as the state of South Dakota is concerned, we do not get the sales tax on that because the customer will receive it outside of our state. Um, so in Nacho Cruz's question where he has the statue fabricated and designed in California and delivered to a client in California, there will be no South Dakota sales tax because that customer will receive it in California. There again, what California would require of you, I can't answer, but it, there would be no South Dakota sales tax. Any shipping and handling on those products, same sales tax rate as the product itself. So include your, your shipping and handling in the amount that is sales taxed. Um, were there any questions on this particular category before we move on? Yeah, there were just a couple um, that likely are, are, are answered, but just to jump in, um, let me find them here. Um, so same thing if someone is, is working online, I, the person asking this question, I know does a lot of voiceover work and a lot of music creation oh, sure. um, uh, for, for film and for, for other projects. Um, mm -hmm. So if they're providing the service out of South Dakota, but the client is based in another state, that would be a similar thing to this in-person sale where it's, it's, an out, it's where the client is located. Yes, 
It'll be where the client receives that product. So if they're, you know, receiving a download of an audio file or they're receiving some sort of a, you know, digital report or whatever, and that client receives it, say, in California and Hollywood, no South Dakota sales tax. Um, yes. And then would that be similar? Um, Barbara was asking as a photographer um, for which city to report the sale in. So she's a photographer. She does work all around the Black Hills. So it's wherever the final purchaser is based. That is the city that the sales tax would need to be paid in. Photography is a little bit special. Jean, you might have to help me here. If it's um, a charge for the actual photo shoot, it's where the shoot takes place, correct? And that's if they bill the photo shoots separately okay. from where the photos yeah. are. So it depends on how they're billing their customer. Right. And then if, yes, you receive your, your photo packages, whether digital or a physical photo, it will be where the, the client receives those photos. Yes. So if, if they ch charge for the shooting separate, it'll be based on where the photos are taken. And then if they later charge for that photo package, it'll be based on where the photo package is received. And that's probably not going to be the same locations. We do have a very nice uh, fact sheet on photography that has all those little scenarios. So for a photographer, we can send that link out later too to kind of get more of those scenarios and how it works for photography. Great, thanks. Um, one more quick question that came up related sure. to this from Melissa. Um, she's wanting to clarify her studio is in the county of Yankton, but outside of city limits. So um, she's charging, she's not charging a city sales tax then on anything picked up at her studio. She is correct. If she is outside of city limits, it would be the state tax rate only. Yes. But if she is shipping to somebody, then it would be wherever their location is. Yes. Great, and likewise, you. if um, you ship the item to someone who lives in a rural address, it would be only the 4% or 4.5% sales tax rate, yes. And I'd like to add that on our website, we've got what's called our sales tax rate lookup function. And it's where you can go in and put your customer's address in to see what that sales tax rate is. Oh, sorry, Lori. I just that's okay. I was just like, that's my next slide. I'll just move on to that. <laughs> Go ahead, Gene, though. <laughs> it's, yeah, um, you know, yeah, it's called the sales tax rate lookup. When you get on our website at dor.sd.gov, there's an orange box right at the top that says online services. And I believe that that will link you right. That's one of the options that it links to is this sales tax rate lookup. You can put in the address and it's going to tell you uh, the current rate. One thing to be aware, though, it is only going to give the general rate. It's not going to give those extra taxes of the gross receipts or the tourism tax. Um, so just kind of be aware of that it it'll give you, you know, it's inside city or outside city at the general rate only. And yeah, the link is on the slide here as well, so we can make sure to get that to everybody later on. We also that have that link when we send out information to our. Um, our taxpayers when we issue their tax license, that's a link in the new license letter that we send out. Um, and for someone who asked earlier, I do believe this presentation is being recorded so you can come back and look at it later. Um, and I do intend to share the slide deck with Andrew and with Jim so they can share it with everybody too. So you'll have all these resources to look at later on as well. All right, so. Festivals and craft fairs. Um, in South Dakota, all our special event sales are also subject to sales tax. Um, so we've got a variety of events all over the state. They're going to go from huge like the Sturgis Rally to small like an art fair that maybe is happening at a church or something like that. They're of every size and every style um, with every number of vendors. Um, but your sales at those special events are going to be subject to the sales tax. So if you already have a South Dakota sales tax license, you're just gonna report those special event sales on your next scheduled return as you would any of your in-person in-store sales. If you are coming just to South Dakota for the one event and you don't have a South Dakota sales tax license, we can give a one-time special event return. Um, we get in touch with the event organizer. They give us a list of the vendors who are coming and we just make sure to get everybody that one-time form. So that way, if somebody is attending one event in South Dakota, you don't have to become licensed and you don't have to continue filing a regular return. 
you can just kind of do the the one and done option. And it's a little more convenient for people who are, you know, a lot of our stock show vendors are here one time a year. So we let them file just this one time special event return. Um, just to take note, there are a couple of exceptions to this. The Sturgis Motorcycle Rally and the South Dakota State Fair do have extra licensing requirements. So if you're attending one of those two particular events, be aware there is extra licensing required. Uh, the Sturgis Rally, we work that here in the Rapid City office and would handle that. Um, the State Fair is handled out of our Aberdeen office. They'd be the experts to go to with questions on, on what's required for the State Fair. Um, so we've got a, a couple of examples here of how the tax is going to apply if we're selling our product at the Spearfish Festival in the park. It's just the example I picked. So the you sold the product, the customer took it with them right there at the festival in Spearfish. So today that rate is going to be 8%. Uh, again, changing July 1st, but um, it'll be the 4.5% state tax. 2% is going to go to Spearfish as the municipal tax. And there we've got our 1.5% tourism tax because this is taking place at a spectator event. Um, and just like with our in-store sale, if you ship that product to our customer in Sioux Falls, it's based the same sales tax rate. It's just the city of Sioux Falls is going to get that municipal sales tax instead of the city of Spearfish. And in the same example as our in-person sales, if you ship that to your customer in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there's going to be no South Dakota sales tax. Check with whatever Minnesota is going to require. Um, so that's kind of the quick and dirty about festivals and uh, craft fairs. Are there questions? Follow up on that. Yeah, there are a couple related to the uh, to the fairs as well as a couple from the uh, the tourism components. Um, sure. Uh, one question came in from Kate: Is are um, are powwows treated as tourism or as these festivals and craft fairs? Um, I the powwow that is held every year at the Monument Arena, yes, is going to be a tourism taxable event. Um, if it's open to the public. And as a, a festival, I would say, yes, it's going to be a tourism tax event. If it's something that's private, um, there could be a maybe, maybe not. We'd probably want to look at it closer to make that determination. Um, and then her question, state land versus red reservation, that's really going to depend on where. Um, because we do have tax collection agreements with several tribal entities in South Dakota where they receive the tax money on those, those grounds. So if their tax agreement includes the tourism tax, then yes, it would apply. So, you know, if you have a question on a specific one, we'd happily look it up for you, but it kind of varies by jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So... My apologies, my best answer on that is maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, uh, so one related to these uh, festivals, if if you're a band performing at a festival in Spearfish, this comes from Kay, would you charge the full 8% for singing at the event just for your services? You're not selling any goods there, but just for providing your performer services. Is that coming later in the presentation? Um, yeah. Can we put okay. a pin in that one? Perfect. That's going to come yep. up a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Great. Um, then I believe, um, oh, the only other question related to this was back to, on the tourism side. Um, um, you know, the spectator events, uh, Nancy was asking, is a play that is not a part of a festival, it's just a play that is put on, um, is that considered a spectator event as far as a tourism uh, tax? I'll take this one, Laurie. Sure. Um, in our tourism tax facts, um, playhouses are listed as a visitor attraction. So that's why the tourism tax would apply. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> Great, thanks. I was thinking um, yes, but I'm glad you had the solid answer. <laughs> I got the tax facts. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> See, this is why I have Jean here backing me up today, folks. <laughs> and, and you know, these tax facts that we're referencing, the public has access to these on our website, so you can have the same information right in front of you. And we have a link to that at the end of the presentation as well, where you can find all of them. So, 
Great. Well, there's um, a few IGC. other general questions that I think, you know, we can wait on, but um, we can come yeah. back to. Okay. Yep. All right. I think I went out of order. Jean, you want to hop in on online? <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> so sales tax when selling online, if you're based here in South Dakota, like Lori explained earlier, it's going to be based on where your customer receives that product in South Dakota. Now, if you are shipping outside of South Dakota on a regular basis, you need to be aware that other states have what's called remote seller laws, just like South Dakota does. And for example, South Dakota, if you are, let's say you are a North Dakota business and you are shipping product into South Dakota on a regular basis, and you hit that threshold of $100,000 worth of sales in the calendar year, we're going to, South Dakota's gonna say, hey, you've got an economic presence in our state. You meet that remote seller law threshold. Now you're required to get licensed to collect sales tax on all of your sales coming from North Dakota into South Dakota. So the reverse is true for you. If you are a South Dakota based business and you're selling into another state, you need to be aware that if you meet their thresholds, you could be required to get licensed in that state. Now, granted, South Dakota has a pretty low threshold of $100,000. There's plenty of other states that have thresholds um, higher than that. Some states also count the number of transactions. South Dakota used to. We used to say 200 separate transactions or $100,000 worth of sales. Um, I believe that's effective July 1st. We've taken that 200 separate transactions out of the equation. Now we just look at the total number of sales um, into our state. So on our website, we also have a great link um, to, I think it's a streamlined sales tax page that has a list of all the states and that have a remote seller laws and what their thresholds are. So my advice to you, if you're located here in South Dakota and you're shipping to another state on a regular basis, you can start looking at that and finding out if you need to, you know, get licensed in that state, you can always do a Google search and look for the Department of Revenue in that state, give them a call and talk to them directly about your business activity. Um, but know that if you physically go into another state, rem remember that significant presence, that nexus, um, when you are physically there, you automatically have to follow their rules. So if you know you're going to attend a vendor event in another state, you know, pick up the phone, give them a call, shoot them an email, um, find out ahead of time what your requirements are. Because if you know going in what you need to do, then you will do the right things and pay the right amount of tax, which ultimately will save you money in the long run. Because from an agent's perspective, when I have to go out and I have to contact a vendor who's been coming into South Dakota and met those thresholds, it's not a lot of fun when I have to say, I know you've been here, this, 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 and this. And yeah, maybe you didn't hit that $100,000 because you were physically here. And that's one thing that people get confused. Let me take a step back here. There's two things that can make you get a South Dakota sales tax license. Number one, physical presence. You are physically here selling a product or service. Number two, you are not here, but you're selling product into our state and you hit that thousand hundred thousand dollar sales threshold. So in order for the $100,000 to apply, you cannot physically be located in South Dakota and you cannot physically come here and create that significant presence, okay? So when you are here and you're selling there to another state, that's where those thresholds come into play. But if you physically go there to attend a vendor event, that's different. Those thresholds are no longer in play. You have to abide by what those rules are, what those laws are, because you're physically there. And like I said before, as an agent, and we have to contact people who physically come here, and we know that they're doing more than one or two vendor events, then we have to go back and collect that tax. And you know, you're probably wouldn't be happy either if I collected the tax plus interest and plus penalties, <laughs> because you should have been licensed a little while ago, a year ago, two years ago, whatever that case may be. So when selling online, can um, I butt in for one second, Jean? Yes, please. Um, I was just going to say, if you're sitting here and going, uh-oh, I've just realized I should have maybe been licensed for a while already. Don't panic. It's okay. 
we can fix it, you know, just put in your application and when the agent contacts them, just say, hey, I've been here this long, I need to get caught up. You know, we're not gonna punish you for that. We, it's always fixable, so. <laughs> You won't, you won't get punished, but unfortunately, <laughs> there are interest and penalties when returns aren't filed and paid on time, Right, <laughs> which can feel like a punishment, it can, but, but it's not, but, it's you not know, a you punishment. Don't, it's, don't need to be scared, you know, you don't, don't put off contacting us because you're like, uh oh, I should have done this six months ago or whatever. It's, we can get you caught up. <laughs> yep. And I work with a lot of a lot of companies, um, you know, especially companies that move in here from another state who don't realize that we tax things like services, right? And so, you know, they come forward after meeting with their local accountant to go up. Oh, I should have been licensed last year. You know, we work together. We'll get you licensed. We'll get you the returns. We'll get you filed. We'll get you paid. Um, and, you know, we will help you through this process. Okay. That's a good point. Thank you, Lori. So when you are here in your license and you're selling online, follow those rules. Um, and then if you are here and you are selling online through a marketplace, well, that changes the rules just a little bit. So um, back in 20, was it 2018, that uh, um, when we won the Wayfair case and that Wayfair case um, established that economic presence for out-of-state companies to get licensed, we also incorporated those marketplace providers, okay? So marketplace provider are companies like Amazon, eBay, Etsy. They're a platform that you can list your product on online and sell it without having to have your own website created. You use their website, right? And so, you know, a lot of crafters use Etsy. I see that a lot of times um, and it's a great place to go and list your product. So when you do that and people in South Dakota buy your product, Etsy is going to collect the sales tax from your customer and Etsy is going to pay it into the state of South Dakota. So that means you don't have to worry about collecting the sales tax and paying it in because Etsy does that for you. And the reason why Etsy is licensed to do that is because Typically, your customer is going to pay Etsy for that product, and then Etsy is going to give you that portion of that sale, okay? So since Etsy is receiving the money for the product, it's their gross sales, their gross receipts. So they are responsible for collecting that sales tax based on where it's received in South Dakota and paying it into the state. And I get the question oftentimes about um, how do I know? there's no way for you to know, okay, other than the reports that you get from Etsy showing what your sales are and where that product was shipped to, okay? There's no way for you to guarantee that Etsy is taking that sales tax and paying it into the state of South Dakota. So it's up to the state of South Dakota to audit Etsy to make sure all the sales that are shipped into South Dakota are getting taxed correctly and that sales tax is getting paid into the state. Just because you have an Etsy account doesn't mean we're going to hold you responsible for sales at, at, through that Etsy platform, okay? Your responsibility on that platform is to tell us you've got sales, but guess what? They get also listed on line three as a non-taxable sale. So if you're familiar with the sales tax return at all, you know that you got to tell us about your total sales, whether they're taxable or non-taxable. That's what goes on line one. So Etsy would go online one as a gross sale, but then also a non-taxable sale. So you don't pay the sales tax on it, but you do have to tell us about it because it is part of your total sales. So if we have a marketplace provider that with all the businesses they have listed on their marketplace, that they're making sales in the South Dakota, at least $100,000 in a calendar year, we are required them to get a tax license. And we have a team of agents in our compliance division that's working with these companies on a regular basis to bring them into compliance and to get them to start collecting the sales tax, which ultimately makes it easier for businesses who list on those marketplaces because you don't have to worry about the collection and paying of the sales tax. Um, and like this slide shows, just because you're selling on Etsy exclusively or any other marketplace provider that's licensed to collect South Dakota sales tax, even though that's all you do, 
we still require that you get a sales tax license, even though you may never pay in any sales tax to the state. Okay, you are physically here and you're selling a product that is subject to sales tax. And that is why you've got to have that sales tax license. And it's good to have as well because um, you may make that occasional sale to a friend or family member or, you know, somebody outside of that Etsy marketplace, and you're going to need the sales tax license to report and pay that sales tax. Um, and then also it lists here, if you're not located in South Dakota, the marketplace will handle the sales tax for you. And if you make any sales directly into South Dakota without going through a marketplace, then, you know, we need to look at your business activity to see if you're required to get a tax license or, you know, you don't have to meet that activity level to voluntarily get a tax license. And some out-of-state companies do that um, because it's a benefit to your customer. Um, in South Dakota, if you don't pay sales tax on a purchase, you will use tax on it. And use tax, the only difference between sales and use tax is who you're paying that tax to. Sales tax, you pay it when you buy it to your supplier. Use tax, you pay it directly to the state because it wasn't charged to you by your buyer. So you may find that some companies out there don't make a lot of sales into South Dakota and not hit that $100,000 transaction, but voluntarily get licensed because they know for their customers perspective that it's easier for them. It's a convenience for them. So um, if you are looking to get set up on a marketplace and, and you're located here in South Dakota and you want to make sure that that marketplace is licensed. If you're going through all the fine print of getting set up with them and they don't talk about collecting sales tax for South Dakota, give us a call. Let us know who you're looking at if you're going to get set up on them and we can tell you whether they have an active sales tax license or not. Okay. One of the things about being licensed in South Dakota, um, anybody can call us and tell and ask us, hey, is this business, do they have a sales tax license? The only thing we're going to tell them is yes or no. Okay. I cannot give out any confidential information in regards to that business. Where are they located at? What's their phone number? Hey, I know I bought such and such thing from them. Did they report and pay the tax on that? Right. We don't give out those answers. That's confidential information, but we will tell you whether they have an active tax license or not. Okay. All right. Do you want to take sales on consignment, Lori, or would you like me to keep on trucking? Um, I think I can do it. Awesome. <laughs> Did we have any um, online or marketplace questions before we move on, though? We we answered all of them that had come in right before you got to that section, so it was perfect. Well, timing. perfect. All right, so sales on consignment. This will be where you are consigning your product to somebody else's shop and the shop will make the sale and collect the money. This is almost working kind of similar to how the marketplace provider that Jean just described is working. Um, the consignment shop is going to collect that sales tax on the whole selling price of that item. The tax rate is going to depend on where the customer receives the product, just like in all of our previous examples. And in with a consignment case, it's common that the consigner may get a commission or a portion of that sale. The commission that the shop gets to keep is not subject to the sales tax. So their portion that they keep is not a, also sales taxable. Um, for the artist who's actually consigning the product, you're not gonna collect the sales tax on that because it will already have been done by the consignment shop. And if you have a, a South Dakota sales tax license, just like Jean described for the marketplace provider, you'll report it on your line one as your total sales, and then you will deduct it right out as non-taxable because the tax was already paid by the consignment shop. So it really works very much like how the marketplace provider works. Um, any questions on that before I move on? Nope, once again, answered them all, all in advance. Perfect work. Sounds great. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how an exemption certificate works. And I know somebody had a question um, earlier that's gonna kind of relate to this. When you provide your product to that consignment shop, they may have you do what's called an exemption certificate. And you're gonna keep that as proof of why you didn't do sales tax on that item that you consigned with the shop because they ultimately resold it for you. 
So your exemption certificate is what you're using to back up that it was a non-taxable sale. It's something you're going to want to keep on file for three years. Um, they don't generally expire unless the customer information changes. In uh, my previous days when I used to be in audit, I kid you not, I saw one as old as 1940. So <laughs> um, we do generally uh, recommend though, maybe try to get them updated every three years or so. So they're current within the audit period. <laughs> Um, and if the purchaser is from a state that doesn't have a sales tax license number, they can use their home state license number on that exemption certificate. Or if you're maybe from Montana that doesn't have a sales tax, they could put a social security number on as a identifying number. So just because they don't have a South Dakota sales tax license doesn't mean they can't use that exemption certificate. Um, Here's just an example of what it looks like. It's pretty basic information. You know, you put who's the purchaser, and then you're going to put your reason of why it is exempt. In most cases, it's going to be a sale for resale. So the person who asked earlier, um, they were hiring someone to do some laser or something. Um, what you can do is, is you're only going to charge that sales tax on your final sold product. So there can be this exemption completed and the product between the laser cutter and you is going to be sales tax exempt as a component of that final product. And there will only be sales tax on your final sold product. Um, hopefully that answered his question <laughs> for him. Um, keep your exemption certificates for three years just as a backup. Lori, I'd like to add one yes. other item on the certificate of exemption form. You You're going to see um, taxpayer's tax ID number. You're going to see a term like resale number. When you're in South Dakota or you have a South Dakota sales tax license, put your sales tax license number there, please. It's um, all South the same Dakota thing. <laughs> yeah, it's different term, same number. Yep. Um, South Dakota does not issue a separate number to buy for resale. So that sales tax license number is valid as your tax ID number and as your resale number on this form. Thank you, Jean, that's a good point. So it's also possible that you could be selling to an actual exempt entity. Um, in South Dakota, that would be your government entities, including your schools, uh, cities, volunteer fire ambulance departments. Our tribal governments are exempt from sales tax in South Dakota. Um, nonprofit hospitals, religious educational institutions, that's going to be your, your schools. Um, here in Rapid City, it would be St. Thomas More, Rapid City Christian. And, and then nonprofit accredited private educational institutions, that would be certain colleges. <laughs> and nonprofit charitable relief organizations, that is going to be your entity like the Salvation Army or the Cornerstone Rescue Mission or the groups who are providing goods or services to the poor or the distressed um, population. Those last three that have the asterisk there to be tax exempt, they will have a number issued from the Department of Revenue to verify that they have that tax exempt status. So not every um, nonprofit organization is necessarily tax exempt. Um, so just something to be aware of, you know, in the arts community, it's possible, you know, maybe you're selling an art piece to a city for a city hall and, and the city could purchase that tax exempt from you. It would have to be purchased with actual city funds. Um, or likewise, if you're selling something to a school, make sure it's actually purchased by the school from school funds. If um, it's the local PTA purchasing it, they do not get the school's tax exempt status. They, uh, they are taxable. Or likewise, you know, I'm an employee of the state of South Dakota, but my employer's tax exemption doesn't apply to me. I'm not allowed to go and purchase tax exempt products just because I work for the Department of Revenue. My, my funds are still taxable. <laughs> so a similar kind of idea when you, you look at other entities like that. Um, church is not exempt from sales tax in South Dakota. Um, that's something that's um, very commonly confusing to people as well. And then just to remember, just because they're nonprofit doesn't mean they're necessarily tax exempt. They might be doing 
very wonderful good works and good products, but it doesn't necessarily make them tax exempt. Um, and if you're in doubt, you can always contact us at the Department of Revenue. We can look into it. And like Jean said, we can let you know, yes, they're um, a licensed exempt entity or not. All right. You want to hop in on entertainers? You bet. So in the entertainment industry, typically, you could get paid for those entertainment services. And so if you're receiving payment for that service, you're probably going to be subject to sales tax unless you are performing uh, at an event that has a covered charge or tickets. So whoever is receiving the money for the cover charge or whoever is collecting money for the tickets is responsible for paying the sales tax on the cover charge or on the tickets. And that sales tax rate would be determined by state, city, city gross receipts, if that city elects to have that additional 1% tax on admissions, and then could be tourism tax if those tickets are sold. Um, or actually there would be tourism tax because <laughs> it's a spectator event, sorry. So, you know, those, you gotta remember about those different tax rates to determine what your total sales tax rate is. And if you ever have questions on that, please, you know, feel free to give us a call. But as an entertainer, if there's tickets charged at the door, then you do not have to charge the company or, or company or, uh, or facility that hired you you don't have to charge them sales tax on your service because that service is being resold to the people who attend that event. So the sales tax gets paid at the cover charge or the ticket sales in this example, okay? But let's say you are, um, this is a, an event that's free to the public and you are being paid by the venue to provide your entertainment services. Then you're going to do the four and a half percent state sales tax plus the applicable city tax. So just the state and city general rates. You don't do the 1% gross receipts tax because it's not tickets to that event, okay? And you don't do the tourism tax because this is a purchase by the venue, okay? And that makes a difference. So in Rapid City, if you were um, set up at the Dahl Fine Arts Center, and you were providing um, your entertainment services, okay? And um, it was a, a company that has hired you to provide this musical entertainment, then you would only charge them six and a half percent sales tax because Dolphin Arts, located in Rapid City, you're getting um, hired by an individual who's providing this entertainment service to maybe their employees or, you know, a, a, sp a specific group, okay? And they've rented a space at the Dahl Art Center to do that, okay? So each scenario is different and it can be very confusing when you're new to this um, to make sure that you're getting the correct sales tax rate. So please feel free to um, contact us when you have those questions. Um, a lot of times you may see um, that somebody just, you know, it's kind of a one and done sort of thing. Um, I've got a situation where, um, you know, I know how to, I've been a performer, I just don't do it on a regular basis. And I was called in to help kind of a one and done thing. Um, and that's a case where the venue um, may pick up the use tax on that service, but we strongly encourage all musical entertainment entertainers and artists to have their own sales tax license unless it's truly that one-off event, okay? Because you have the first responsibility to collecting and paying in that sales tax because you are the entertainer. You are that service provider, okay? Anything you'd like to add there, Lori? I was, I was asked to mention if you are performing somewhere and say you've put out a tip jar and people can throw some money in there, um, tips that are voluntarily given are not sales taxable in South Dakota. So if they can choose to give you whatever amount they want, you don't have to do sales tax on it. Um, 
The only time you're gonna run into a difference is if you put out there, okay, suggested donation, five bucks. Well, then you've set a price and then you could switch yourself over into sales taxable category. Um, so in order for just those tips, to mention that. <laughs> in order for those tips and donations to tru truly be not subject to sales taxes, you're providing the same entertainment service to somebody who gives you $0 to somebody who gives you a thousand dollars i mean it's the same yeah. thing because it's truly you know given whatever you know they can decide what they want to give so it's truly given freely at that point that's all i had to add on that one <laughs> thanks larry <laughs> and then moving on to lessons so if you um uh like to teach others on how to um to perform, uh, whether it's teaching them a musical instrument or dance or even art lessons, you know, those things are subject to sales tax. So it's the state rate of four and a half percent plus where your customer receives that lesson. So where that class is located. So if you have a, a studio in Rapid City, and I know a lot of um, uh, people in the music industry um, do teach. In fact, my, my daughter takes oboe lessons here in Rapid City. And, um, and so we get charged six and a half percent sales tax on those oval lessons because she goes to her teacher's um, place of business and receives that lesson there. Um, I've had, uh, in fact, just in the last year or so, I had a music teacher come forward who um, was doing online lessons through Zoom. Can you imagine doing a musical lesson <laughs> through Zoom? It caught me off guard. I hadn't heard about that before, but uh, she had students from the state that she currently or previously was living in that she kept with her when she moved to South Dakota. So she was doing Zoom music lessons to students in other states, which I thought was pretty awesome. And so, of course, because her student wasn't receiving that lesson in South Dakota. She wasn't at her place of business in South Dakota. She was receiving that service in another state. There's no South Dakota sales tax due on that. Um, and so with lessons, it's the state rate of four and a half percent if they receive it in South Dakota, plus the general city tax rate. So the 2% for Rapid City in my example. Um, there's no additional gross receipts tax on that. And there's no tourism tax that would apply to lessons. And then any equipment used. Um, so for example, with um, my daughter's oboe lessons, her teacher has uh, music stands. Her teacher provides her with music when she's you know, moving from one level to the next. We never have to buy a music book. Her teacher provides it all to us. And so when her teacher goes out to make those purchases, she should be paying sales tax on those purchases because she's using it to provide her service. Okay? All right. All right, we're running a little long here, so I'm going to blast through these next couple of screens here. Sorry, guys, we're, we were chatty at you this morning. Um, when you get a sales tax license, the agent who issues the license will go through how to file and pay the sales tax returns with you. We're going to set you on a schedule that's going to be really based on how much quantity of business you have. So over a certain dollar amount, you'll probably be filing monthly. If it's a smaller amount of business, it could be as little as twice a year. And the agent will go through that when they issue the license for you. Um, to file and pay the return, we've got two ways you can do that. We have an online system, which we call ePath. And then we do still have a paper form available. Um, the issuing agent would go through that. We like to encourage ePath just because it does all the math for you. It fixes some of the common mistakes for you. Um, and you do get to keep a little percentage of what we call a collection allowance as a, basically a bribe to use the online <laughs> filing. Um, so it's really not that hard to get set up on the, the ePath. An agent can always help you do your first couple of returns if you're unsure. And, and once you get going on it, I, most people find it pretty easy to use. So. What I love about ePath from an agent's perspective is when I have a taxpayer who has questions, make sure that they are filling out their sales tax return correctly. I can see a summary of what they're doing in ePath as they do it. And so we I can, can help, yeah. Yeah, I can catch those common mistakes if they're missing a city tax, if they're you know missing the tourism tax, I can see that before they submit the return, which lessens the likelihood that they're going to have to go back and fix the return in the future should they make a mistake 
on those city taxes or tourism taxes. Yeah. It's also very common when um, you file a first return that an agent's going to look at your first return. And if we notice something wrong with it, contact you. So, you know, that's not something to be worried about. We'd much rather fix a mistake happening, you know, at your first couple of returns than see a mistake continue to happen. And then three years later go, oh, you've been messing this up all this time. So that's, it's common that we try to look at those first couple of returns. Um, we have a couple of different ways of making payments. You can still do a physical paper check. You can do a, in what we call an ACH or an online electronic payment. And you can pay with credit card. There is a, a processing fee that goes with paying with credit card. So I like to encourage, use the ACH um, electronic payment because that option's free. <laughs> All right, and then just a quick note about record keeping. Keep all your business receipts for at least three years, and that's everything. Your receipts that for stuff you bought, your invoices for things that you um, build people for in whatever form it is, whether it's, you know, you have a fancy computer system that's recording everything or you're keeping it in a, you know, a paper receipt book. As, as, long, as long as you're recording it and keeping it, you're going to be good, but do make sure you keep track of what your sales are in South Dakota. It's very important from a state perspective when we come in and we do a review or an audit of your records, but it's also important from an IRS, your federal income tax perspective, to have all these records as well. All right. So in here, we're just coming up to here's the various ways you can contact us. There's our toll-free number, which is available 8 to 5 Central Time in South Dakota, Monday through Friday. Um, we have uh, the BizTax email, which is monitored also every working day. A lot of good information on our website. You can call or visit one of our local offices. And we do have live chat available on our website. There's a little button that you can click on there and you will be typing with an actual live agent. It's not a bot replying to you. <laughs> um, so that's a nice feature uh, too for, you know, maybe you're, for whatever reason, can't talk on the phone. You can quick type out a message and, and someone can reply to you. So lots of different ways to get a hold of us if you have questions. And then there's a whole list. We're in a variety of cities around the state with different offices, um, all there for your reference in the future. So wherever you are, there's hopefully one not too far away from you that you can get a hold of. Like Jean mentioned earlier, if you're going to an event in a certain city, best thing to do is contact that local office because they're going to be the most familiar with that local event and they're going to know the lay of the land and what you need to do and can best help you. Um, and then here's just kind of a list of my resources, some of those publications we talked about and the link at the bottom there of where all of our online documents can be found. Um, other than that, uh, questions? Yeah, we have a, a few here that I think we can we can kind of rapid fire through. Sure. Um, uh, a couple that were kind of related to the to the very beginning. Um, yeah, Tasha was wondering if she has two separate businesses. Um, does she need two separate licenses, one for each business entity? Um, are they two different storefronts, or she's operating at the same place just with two different business names? I'm sure I'll is, see if Tasha can can add that to the chat. If it is two separate stores, yes, you would need two separate licenses. If you are, say, operating your music lesson business and your art studio together in your same studio, we could probably run that on one license then. Great. Um, and then, you know, a, a pretty core one is, is what happens if you're selling goods or services and you forget to charge sales tax so you don't add the sales tax to your initial fee? How do you uh, process that payment? Um, you do still have the right to go to your client and say, hey, I didn't charge you the sales tax. I need to add it on. You know, that would be up to your business decision of what you want to do. Um, Certain industries, such as like the food service and the bar industry, will do what we call backing out the sales tax, where they're going to charge a flat fee, you know, say it's $10, and then they're going to back that sales tax out of that whole amount. So they're just going to have on their receipt tax was included. Um, 
you're going to probably sometimes see that, especially with artists maybe selling their merch at a show where they're just going to say, I'm selling this CD for $20 and you can back that tax out of that. And a, the issuing agent, when they issue the license, can talk you through how to do that. Um, great. Uh, Debbie came in with a follow-up question to the two uh, business uh, licenses that is similar. Um, in her case, she operates two different theater companies. They perform in different venues, but she is the operator of both of these different named theater companies. Um, do they each need their own sales tax license? I think we could get away with doing one license on that one. There again, it's going to kind of depend on how she has her business entity set up. If she's got it structured as two separate LLCs, we're probably going to do two. But if she's operating it as one LLC with just two different, you know, theater group A and three theater group B, we could probably do one license there. Great. Um, all right. Um, looking oh, at a two couple of LLCs, then oh, yeah. it's two licenses. Yep. <laughs> um, how about if you're only selling on consignment, so all of your work is being sold elsewhere and the sales tax is being covered by the purchaser, do you need a license, uh, a sales tax license at that point? Um, uh, if you're I'm sure that'll come up in with South the Dakota, yes. Okay. Yep. Because then you would need license. that to provide that that certificate, yes. the exemption yep. certificate. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Um, then a couple of questions about um, oh sorry one other related to to kind of commission type sales so uh, melissa was wondering if she sells a commission while at a show in sioux falls but they wait and pick it up at her studio so they come to pick it up at a different location from where the initial sale is would mm -hmm. uh, she pay that on where the the point of purchase or where the product was picked up where it's picked up great yep um Great. And then a, another, a couple of questions about some uh, exemption, uh, sales tax exempt questions are art supplies. So paint canvases that you use for the product, uh, is that cons uh, sales tax exempt um, or would you pay sales tax on that? If it's a component part of your final product, yes, you can buy that sales tax exempt considered as a, a, a sale for resale. Yes. As a sale for resale. Perfect. Yep. Um, um, the only thing you couldn't would be your, your reusable tools. So like your brushes or that sort of thing, you could not. Okay. So it has to be a part of the final product. Oh, go ahead, Jean. I think my voice is about done, Jean. I'm going to let you take over. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm at home. My dogs are a little riled up about something. So if you hear the barking in the background, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what was the question, Andrew? Oh, it, 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 we were just we were just following up on the the, the paint supplies. So, um, for right. instance, if it's something reusable, you do have to pay sales tax on it if it's a tool. Yes. But if it's something that is a part of the piece that stays with the piece and moves on to the final sale. You got right. it. That is um, correct. Yep. And any cleaning supplies that you use in order to maintain those brushes and such, those uh, any safety gear that you wear to make sure that you um, are, are safe in using that equipment, those are things that you need to pay sales tax on because they're not a component part to the product that you will sell. Um, a couple of, of other quick questions. Um, if someone is donating a product to a fundraiser, do they need to keep track of any of that for sales tax purposes? So it's something that they've created, they're, they're giving away as a donation. Um, obviously, they would need to talk to their, their federal tax uh, preparer to see how that would impact their federal taxes, but is there any sales tax obligation? There could be. And I say that because it depends on, did they pay sales tax on all the components that went into making that product that they're giving away. So if you know that you're going to make something and you are going to give it away, whether that is a, a donation, um, and, uh, just a gift to a person, a donation for a fundraiser, we want you paying sales tax unless you are donating it to a sales tax exempt entity. Okay. So for example, um, you decide to donate um, your time and Excuse me, I'm sorry.
No problem. Usually it's, it's usually when I'm at home, it's my dog barking on these webinars. So yeah. it's, it's I'm everyone's all, used all to it. Part at the end on you here, Andrew, the, sorry. The UPS guy <laughs> arrived and you know how, you know, exciting that yeah. is. So um, back to what I was saying, if you're making a product and you're going to be giving it away to a, an organization that's normally exempt from South Dakota sales tax, um, if you took it out of your uh, inventory um, where you haven't paid sales tax on those products because it's given to a sales tax exempt entity, there's no tax due on that. Okay. Um, but if you are taking product out of your sales tax exempt entity and you are giving it away as, uh, for example, maybe there's an individual in your community that has some health issues and they're raising money to help offset those medical expenses. Um, because that individual is not a sales tax exempt entity, you would owe use tax on what it costs you to make that product. So you would have to do a reasonable estimate, you know, what goes into the cost of that product and pay the use tax on it. Great. Um, following up, uh, two kind of follow-up questions from that. One is, uh, what about distributing promotional copies? Um, would that be kind of the same thing, follow the same yeah. criteria? Perfect. If you're, if you're giving it away, even if it's promotional marketing, gifts, it's, it's tax applies the same way. You either pay sales tax on the components when you buy them because you know you're going to give that product away. But if it comes from your sales tax-free uh, inventory, um, then you're going to owe use tax on your cost, not necessarily not your retail selling price, but your cost. What did it cost you to make that? Um, great. And then a, a, a follow up question in this vein um, from Courtney, if I'm buying an art supply that is considered exempt, how do you provide that information to the store that you're purchasing the so the paint that would physically go on the canvas that would go with how do you uh, provide that to the store? Uh, Lori, can you take gonna, that question? Yeah, I, that's I got... going to be that exemption certificate we talked about is what you're going to provide to that store to, to back that up. Perfect. Uh, a couple other kind of um, um, basic uh, questions. Um, is there any fee for getting a sales tax license? No, not great. to apply. Um, there's not uh, any standard fee to obtain a sales tax license. We do occasionally require um, what we call a bond or basically a deposit, but that's usually only done if, say, the person is on our naughty list from previous bad payment history <laughs> or that sort of thing. But, you know, if you're a new business and you have no negative record, there shouldn't be upfront charges for you. An Great. exception there would be the Sturgis Rally. We do do a $500 deposit there just because um, they're here such a short time and we need some collateral to make sure the tax gets paid. <laughs> but if you are a sales tax license holder, and you're located in South Dakota with a good filing history with us, we will waive that first time yep. deposit for the rally because you're located here. Yep. So if and you don't file and pay your rally taxes, we'll come track you down. <laughs> <laughs> yep great um awesome we're, we're coming up there's fantastic questions and, and great contact we're coming up on the last couple um one and i'm not entirely sure what melissa is referring to here but she's wondering if capital gifts are taxable for sales tax capital gifts i'm not sure what she means by that yeah i would say melissa that would be a question to to call the the department of revenue on more specifically with that scenario um and then if you uh this is an, a teacher that if they're uh they're teaching lessons at a location that collects sales tax so i assume it must be a music store or something like that where the the music store is collecting the payments and the sales tax so then they don't have to worry about paying sales tax on their end correct um, if the store is collecting the payment, um, they can give her that exemption certificate and then she can be a sale for resale. Yes. 
<laughs> perfect. Um, then uh, there are two questions from Sandra uh, Molman, and I may actually have our uh, our friends over at the Arts Council help her out. But she's wondering about a couple of uh, fees specifically for the State Arts Council grants. Uh, one of them is there's the an Artists in Schools and Communities grant, and just kind of wondering if if the artist is is responsible for paying sales tax on some of those services um, and uh, also their fellowship awards. And I think, um, Sandra, I might connect you with that's um, the Arts like Council. I'd like to discuss more offline because I think I'll yeah. have more questions on that to get her a, a solid answer on that. Yeah. Yeah, great. Because there, there, there's more that goes into that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Details well, great. We'll always see matter. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, Awesome. Well, that that answers all the all the questions um, for, for all of you uh, uh, with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We will send out these links as well as the slide deck and the recording of this session. So you can go back and dig back through all this really wonderful information and, and see uh, the parts that apply to your specific arts activities. But uh, just want to say thank you so much uh, to, to, to Lori and to Jean for being with us today. It's been really wonderful to to get this information shared um, and, you know, really, really reminding all of us as, as creative workers that we are small businesses, we are entrepreneurs, and, and there's a, a lot that goes along with that. But, um, but also we're a really important and impactful part of the local economies um, uh, all around the state, whether, whether rural or in the, the larger cities and communities. But thank you all so much. I encourage you, if you have any specific questions, please reach out to, to the Department of Revenue. Um, as they said, the devil is in the details and there's a lot of specifics to go through. Um, but thank you all again so much and for all of the work you do helping keep South Dakota creative. Thank you everyone for inviting us. Thank you. <laughs>